Hey everyone, welcome to the program, WRSA Radio. I am your host, G1. As always, I hope you are having a good week. What a crazy one for events around the world and our nation. Uh, Last week, as I was putting the the closing touches on the show together, uh, you know, putting it together, uh, we got word of the terrorist attack in Moscow. The attack was at a theater, the Crocus Theater, filled with innocent people, and a team of gunmen came in shooting the place up. I did not see a a final toll of casualties, but it was it was well over a hundred. I, I think I had saw a number of 143 um, killed, but uh, that, that was the last number that I'd seen. That, that number may have changed. I did not get an update today, but uh, regardless, that is a terrible, terrible event. My heart goes out to the families of the victims. Um, sorry for, for hearing the, uh, the noises in the background. I've got another computer going, and I've got a, a neighbor mowing his yard. So uh, anyway, I... It, it, terrible, terrible events that took place. I, I cannot imagine the helplessness and, and fear that those people faced as that that event unfolded. The videos of it are out there. There's some, some individuals that took, took uh, videos with their phones in the theater as it was taking place. They are out there and they are terrible. Um, go, go watch them at, at your own discretion. What is also out there is a video of, or multiple videos, of the perpetrators being captured by Russian security forces. At least four of the gunmen and, and a number of others were arrested. Uh, let's, let's just say that they were not, they were not treated well. <laughs> they, they've already paid a price for what they did, but, but I have to say that it, uh, it is probably just the beginning of what they are going to face. I don't believe that Russia has the death penalty anymore. I think they did away with it. I know there were some calls for them to reinstate that, and that may be the case or whatnot that comes out of this, but I suspect these individuals will face a very, very long and, and suffering life in a Siberian prison going forward. There is much debate online regarding who is responsible for this attack. The U.S. was very quick to blame ISIS, uh, which which I'll get back to here in a second. Uh, the Russians, however, initially laid the blame squarely at the feet of Ukraine. Uh, however, Vladimir Putin later kind of changed that. He, he did come out and say that ISIS indeed was a part of this and, and faces... Uh, you know, the the repercussions of this taking place. But I think this is one of those situations where they were both correct. The individuals who were captured indeed pledged their allegiance to ISIS, whatever that really means, whoever ISIS really is. There's a lot of debate about that. They took a video of themselves in front of an ISIS flag, and that looks to have happened just before the attack because... They had their faces covered, but they were wearing the same clothes that they were captured wearing after the attack. Now, that seems a little too contrived for me, uh, very much like they were were making it a point to do that, to kind of lead the investigators down a certain path to to kind of an open and shut case. I don't want to attribute you know, too much to conspiracy there. What is explained by inconsistency? But this is one of those situations that begs deeper questions and possibly lines of inquiry. There's little doubt that one of the gunmen was, in fact, connected to Ukraine. He He's a Muslim and, and was involved with a volunteer unit for the International Legion, this this unit was mostly his particular unit was was mostly Muslim, many of who were uh, veterans of the conflict in Syria, and were from a number of different Muslim nations, uh, all over some in the Caucasus regions and whatnot, the stands, if you will. Uh, there are other members of these foreign units as well who are also of dubious backgrounds and have participated in jihadist type activity around the world. 
and they offer a, a well of resource for someone who's wishing to organize and carry out a terror attack on Russia. It, it fits very well into the culture of plausible deniability that is characteristic of proxy war between the West and, well, basically everybody else, honestly. So I think there's more than enough smoke here to suggest that the threads of this attack on Russia run into various dark places in the, the general region of Ukraine and other, other countries there. I have no doubt that they extend much further west as well, although proving that would likely be almost impossible. But see, that's the issue with the, the culture of deniability. Even if this attack were completely and totally organic, to a group of jihadists who just happen to have some connection to Ukraine, maybe that's, maybe that's completely coincidental. But the target of their actions cannot just accept that as a fact on its face, because this culture is so pervasive that they have to assume that this was rooted in enemy action. And that puts the idea in their decision-making cycle that they must carry out their own act of covert and deniable action to just maintain the pace, maintain their face, so to speak. And we are fed a narrative that we can't really truly verify and confirm due to the nature of the events. All we have to go on is what the media and the governments tell us. Well, you know how much you can trust that. So we're left completely in the dark, open and helpless to do anything about this. We, we can't demand our governments stop doing things that we don't know for sure that they're doing. I guess we can't demand that, but they can, they can deny it to us as well. And we can't hold anyone accountable, even if everything that we suspect is actually true. We, can, we can't blame the so-called enemy for reacting to these actions because we would do the same thing if we were in their place. If this had happened in the United States, we would be wanting to... to conduct a military action to punish someone. It's just kind of the nature of the thing. But it all has the stink of manipulation. We, we have no real idea who is the initiator of this, although we might have some suspicions. We are, are blind and no one cares that we are the ones paying the price for this. These people don't care that they are causing untold suffering and pain to real people as long as their agenda gets pushed. They, they do the flying and we do the dying. And I say all these things because of the second event that happened this week, and that being the cargo ship that crashed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore Harbor, causing it to collapse. Multiple dead or missing people after this ship loses power and goes out of control, destroying this bridge. Uh, the reports are that this is an accident. This is what our government and its agents are telling us. I have no reason to believe them, however. Uh, factually, I don't. I, I can't say they are wrong, that they're lying to us, but I can't say that they're right either. Again, they have such a need to control the narrative because of that deniability that regardless of what really happened, if they don't want us to know the reality of the situation, then they will not give us the true story. And this works across the spectrum. If they want us to think that this was a terrorist attack because it fits into their agenda, then we will be told it's terrorism. If they want us to think it's natural or just an accident, then we'll be told a narrative fitting that description. We have no real way to really be sure. We have a video of the ship and what happened to it. It, it looks like it indeed lost power and went off course, crashing into the bridge. And this very same ship has had a history of accidents. Apparently, uh, it, it once lost control and crashed into a dock in a port uh, in Europe, I believe, a, a number of years back. So it's not out of the question that it indeed suffered an accident, just like we are being told. But the trouble is that the timing of this, the location of this, and the manner in which it happened says that something far deeper could have taken place. Coming so soon on the heels of the Moscow attack is suspicious. 
a major bridge in a significant port city on the eastern seaboard is suspicious. You know, Baltimore is a major port of export, and crashing this bridge down closes it off for an undetermined amount of time, possibly a year or more just to clean up the damage and open the waterway for traffic again, much less rebuilding the bridge. What has been a major target for Ukraine and NATO during this war? Even so far as the Germans actually being involved in trying to take it out? That would be the bridge connecting Crimea to the mainland. So it's suspicious that this bridge would be destroyed. One of the first reports that I saw in the media, and this was just kind of mentioned in an article that you know, here's a quote, and it was quoting from an internal memo, a cybersecurity group, and I believe it was within Department of Homeland Security, about what was happening. And it came out the morning of the accident. It was very early on in the timeline of this taking place. Well, was that report just a routine internal intelligence memo? Or was a hacking attack suspected due to information that maybe we do not have? You would, you would automatically suspect something like that happening. And so it's not out of the question for a cybersecurity group to generate a report on it at the beginning. Hey, this is what happened. We want to let upper management, upper leadership know. Here's the details. But if they had additional information that pointed to a possible vector of attack on the ship, they would want that information to be circulated. So we would never be told that portion of the report. Maybe it said more. Maybe it said, hey, here's, a, here's the reason we think that this might be a cyber attack. It might have just been a report that said, hey, this is happening. No reason to think that there's a cyber or a hacking, whatever attack taking place. But it may very well have said, yeah, here's a vector. This is, this is how it could have happened. We don't know enough yet. We don't know. We, we would not be told this. This was a foreign crew, which in and of itself is, is not really, not, that's not a factor, except it does mean that their loyalties are a possible source of question, okay? Were, were one or more of these crew motivated and or compensated to possibly sabotage this ship and cause this accident? Maybe in such a way as it could not be detected even? We don't know. Who, who would benefit if this bridge was destroyed in an act of terrorism disguised as an accident? And we could wildly speculate here, and honestly, someone with an agenda or a bias could pick any possible bad actor and construct a narrative that showed why it's plausible that they are indeed the bad guys behind this action. And that's the, the nature and the danger of this culture of deniability. And we've lived under this blanket of covert war and breakaway civilizations for so many decades that nothing is really real. It used to be that it only really revolved around politics and, and international affairs. But when those covert groups and factions turned their focus on us, it has brought us into question everything that we believe to be real. We see things on the internet that are so absurd that we think there's no way that that is real, only to find out that, no, indeed it is true. Uh, and then we question, who is it that thinks this way, and why are they doing what they're doing? Our minds have to form some kind of framework and structure to this madness, so we build what we believe to be a, a state or a condition a framework, and we try to fit everything that we see and read and hear about into that framework. We seek to blame someone for all the falsehoods and, and all of the distortion, but struggle to actually pin down who that is. Or we identify a group or an organization and lay the blame at them for everything that is happening, even if we can't really truthfully say that that is real. And we've arrived at a place where the other culture that is in play has fully exposed itself. It has fully matured and developed. And that is the culture of full-spectrum dominance. 
these groups, and make no mistake, what I, what I said before about laying the blame at the feet of gr groups, it's true. This is being done to us by others. I'm, I'm only urging you caution about reflexively placing the blame on a specific group. That may not be the case. So these groups are doing this because they have sought a culture of dominance, whereby they control the narrative of everything across all levels of narrative. And what do I mean by that? Well, we live in a world where we have many narratives, and I'll, I'll call them timelines for convenience. So, so many timelines running at the same time. And most of us have kind of an internal timeline about you know, our body or our feelings about something, our personal matters, whatnot. And then we have kind of an outward timeline that we, that we maintain for our families or spouses or, or close, close associates. And then we have a work timeline and, and a hobby timeline. So all the way up to an international world timeline, except that's the problem for these groups. They don't want us having that many lines of thinking, that much motivation. They, they want to control that full spectrum. And ideally, they want you to not have a narrative that includes things like national political decisions. They, they want your national focus to be on distractions. It makes it easier for them to control that layer. So for many decades, these groups and factions have waged a war on our narratives or our timelines in order to be the ones controlling them. And they've been wildly successful. In fact, they've been too successful. Someone, some group or faction, has played the game so hard that it has caused the thing that they were really, in fact, afraid of. That being, we don't believe them anymore. We've noticed. We've told the little boy crying wolf that we're tired of his lies, and we refuse to jump to his alarms anymore. At least a growing number of us have. And that number keeps getting bigger and bigger. More and more people are coming to the realization that this is all fake. And we're being manipulated. We're paying the price, as I said, while the manipulators profit and gain. This is a terribly dangerous time in the world. I, I don't think we can overstate that at all. So many things can happen that lead to disaster or rational minds can prevail and we can avert the manipulations. But the problem is because that effort has been so complete, even the rational minds have trouble discerning what is the right course of action. Are you making the right decision or are you doing exactly what they want you to do? What a terrible position we're in. I can only caution you to vet your sources and don't believe anything you read or see or hear unless you know it's consistent with things you already know to be true. Have faith. Have patience. And let the story develop before leaping to conclusions. Don't assume it's always the same bad actors or players. Don't assume that it's always a bad actor or a player. It may be, in fact, just a natural thing. That's all we can do, though. Now, this is all I have time for this week. Like and subscribe. Come see us over on Gab. Nice crew and the mothership. And I will see you on the next episode.